So let's rise and stay in prayer. We're still in the Feast of Ascension. So, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Christ God, thou hast ascended in glory, granting joy to thy disciples by the promise of the Holy Spirit. Through the blessing they were assured that thou art the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. Christ is ascended. In glory he is ascended. This morning, here, here's your mouse. I feel that we need to uh, pause a bit and um, talk about the theory that, that, as I mentioned in the email that had the Zoom invite that I sent out on Wednesday. And we need to talk about, I feel, um, the vision of salvation, the theoria, that we were shaped in, you know, about those of us who have come in from outside the Orthodox Church. Uh, the burden of my preaching and teaching, really, is to convey how completely different the understanding of salvation is in the Orthodox Church. From my own observation, which I have um, tested against other brothers of mine, even just this last couple days while I was in Chicago, to see if they, if they agreed, if they saw it the same way, and they do, so that confirms me in the observation. And that is that it seems that outside the Orthodox Church, in one way or another, very subtle ways, one is persuaded to lay down the cross and not take it up. Because if you take up the cross, it's called works righteousness. And in my opinion, that is a heresy. It is not of God. And it is insidious and deadly. And there comes along with that a theoria of salvation, a vision of salvation. So to cut to the chase, because we do have some material that we want to cover this morning, I'm going to share with you what I, uh, what I, what me and my wife both um, experienced as salvation, the theoria, the vision of salvation that we were shaped in, both of us in the Church of the Nazarene. And then if we have time, I might ask you to, well, I would like to know if it's, if it's, if it's fair to what you were shaped in. Uh, because, you know, in my opinion, <laughs> a lot is at stake, if not everything is at stake. This is a serious matter. And uh, so, I've introduced this concept um, of the importance of the theoria the vision of reality, a vision of salvation, by saying in the open, in the, even in the first um, class, that, our, that the theoria we live in, the vision that we live in, shapes us both perceptibly and imperceptibly. Um, playing around with these terms, theoria and proxis, I'm suggesting that for theoria we could say that it is the orienting vision it's an orienting vision. Um, in the Orthodox Church, I should say, it's an orienting vision. Because orient means east. It means eastward. If it's not going eastward, then I guess you'd use the verb directing, a, directed, a directing vision, because you're not orienting yourself to the east. You're orienting your, to the resurrection. You're orienting yourself to the setting sun. Um, and I would call praxis walking the vision. Hey, Mitch. Walking the vision. Now, with the teens, I, li I, I like to illustrate this concept. I asked, I remember I asked Alessa, if Alessa's watching, she might be watching. She might watch the upload. I asked Alessa, at that time, what was she, maybe 14, 15 years old? I asked her to get up 
and I told, I gave her a, a, a target, um, and I could do it with one of you, but we won't take the time. I told her, let's say, to walk to those pictures. So she, let's say that she was Blake and she stood up. I said, Alessa, walk to that picture. What do you think the first thing she did was? The very first thing after getting up? Turn towards it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> she turned toward it. And then while she was halfway, I stopped her and I said, okay, Alessa, I want you to talk, walk, let's say, to the gift shop. What do you think she did? The very first thing. She turned and faced the gift shop. So whatever theoria is shaping you or that you're living in, that's what determines the direction you're walking in. Um, let's see. Um, where's my... Here it is. So that the vision of reality, let's say, or the vision of salvation, that fills our attention, that fills our mind, this directs what we're living for, directs it and it shapes how we live. If I have no theoria, if I have no vision, if my understanding of salvation or reality is vague at, at best, or if I don't really have one, well, honestly, you, you cannot not have one. Uh, it's either explicit or implicit, the vision of reality that you're living in. Even if, you're not believe, if you are an atheist, for example, you don't believe in God. Well, excuse me, that's a theoria. That's a vision. And it will shape how you walk. It will determine the direction in which you walk your life. So if I have, but if I have no theoria, or if I have no, if I'm not, if I'm not, to quote Socrates, if I'm not examining my life, and the theoria that I'm living in, well, I then become a plaything of all the movements of my soul that are going on in my soul. We call them passions. And we list them. Uh, gluttony, lust, greed, anger, envy, vainglory, pride, spiritual uh, despair even, um, and, and the things like that. Those are the things that are, those are the movements that are, you know, constantly rumbling in my soul. So if I have no theoria, then I'm going to be like a pinball machine, right? I'm going to go boom, 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 just whatever, whatever passion is dominating me at the moment. That's the direction that I'm going to go. I'm going to go in the direction of the, of the, of the passion. Now, um, so that, ex that is the importance of the theory, and that's why we're spending so much time in this catechism, in all of my catechisms, to lay out the theory of the church, the vision of the church. Um, but I'm, I, I wonder to what extent those of us coming in from outside the Orthodox Church are able to absorb this vision that we're trying to convey because... Unknown to us, perhaps, because we never really thought about it, we're actually dominated by another vision, the vision that we came in from, and it's still it's still active in us. And so it's 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 a, like a screen, it's like a roadblock that is preventing me from absorbing and understanding uh, the significance of the theoria of the church. So I thought it might be useful to um, bring this theory of salvation that most all of us were shaped, at, shaped in out into the light. Let's, let's expose it. So I, you know, again, uh, I'm confirmed in this because I was talking with Father Estevan, who also um, has a similar um, journey that I have. Um, and I, I was sharing this with him in Chicago these last couple of days, because I wanted to verify my take on how I perceived uh, the, the, doc, the, the vision of salvation as it was presented to us and as we just grew up in it. I don't know if it was ever you know, articulated in a very clearly defined way until maybe you went to seminary, but certainly in our, there, there was this meme, if you will, this, 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 this theory that, that pervaded the atmosphere of the Church of the Nazarene in particular, and I dare say of Protestantism in general. So this is the theory of salvation that, that uh, I was shaped in. 
Do the best. And I'm, and I'm, again, Father Esteban confirms, he agrees, he saw this, he sees the same thing. And his wife also, who was raised also in a Protestant denomination, an evangelical denomination, um, would share this, would, would agree. Um, in the theory of what I was shaped into my wife, I am saved if I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Now I'm saved. Right? Think about it, guys. I'm saved if I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Does this not immediately place me at the mercy of the historical sciences? And there are historians who have claimed that Jesus did not exist. That the evidence is too sketchy. Now what am I going to do? <laughs> well, then I become a, a, a nutcase, right? Because I have to deny the evidence that I'm relying on, the historical evidence. So that's the first thing. If I'm a Wesleyan, as my wife and I were, um, then I am saved... First of all, by believing that Jesus died for my sins, and then when I'm sanctified, when I'm fully cleansed of my sins. Um, so, which I never understood. I could not understand why the Lord could not do it all at once. Why did he have to break it up into two steps? It just made no sense to me. But think about that. I am saved if, uh, and, and sanctified, and if I'm saved and sanctified, it means that I'm completely cleansed of my sins. And the way the Wesleyans get around the sins that I'm, that I'm obviously committing, they just call them ignorance or mistakes. <laughs> if I'm Lutheran or, or Reformed, um, I'm saved when I believe that Jesus died for my sins. then what do I do with the sins that I continue to experience? In my experience in the Nazarene Church, where you are saved and sanctified to complete your whole salvation, what you do with the sins is that you deny them. They're not really sins. They're just mistakes. If you're Outside the Wesleyan tradition, like the Lutheran or the Reformed, well, you basically ignore your sins. You just ignore them. Because I'm saved. And I cannot be saved by works, anything that I do. I'm saved simply by believing that Jesus died for my sins. So if I do sin, especially in the Nazarene church, if I do sin, and it's too egregious for me to just call it a mistake... Well, I, ha I have to say that I have fallen away somehow. I've fallen away somehow from believing in the Lord. Or I have to believe that it didn't somehow take. Um, and now I have to go through the whole rigmarole again. We call it backsliding. It means I've backslidden. And then I have to go through the whole rigmarole again of getting saved and sanctified. So I think what a lot of us did to, uh, for, you know, to avoid that rigmarole well, we just continue to uh, deny that we were sins, sinners. And we just, well, I just made a real bad mistake, but I'm still saved and sanctified. Hi, Dave. Um, but the point, but, but now the question is, um, now that I've been saved and sanctified, now what? Now what do I do with my life? What is, what is the purpose of my life now? Um, I'm saved. There's nothing more I need to do. I just need to try to be moral and continue to believe that Jesus died for my sins. And I'm okay. And now that defines the rest of my life. There's lots of talk. There was lots of talk in our growing up about doing the will of God. But what does that mean? Doing the will of God. What is the will of God for me? What is it? And my wife and I, as we were reflecting back, well, the will of God was... Uh, doing the career that he wanted me to do, uh, choosing the woman or the, you know, the, the mate that he wanted me to have for my wife or my husband. That was to do the will of God. For what purpose? And honestly, I think it's at that point that, 
that we stop thinking. For what purpose? Honestly, for what purpose? And I think that without articulating it, or without thinking, the soul just unconsciously falls into this uh, attitude of, of entitlement. God's job is to be my genie and to grant me whatever will make me happy. In other words, that's, that's the will of God, for me to be happy. In other words, it's all about me. I want a wife. That's what's going to make me happy. So it's God's job, God's job to make me happy, to give me a wife. And if he doesn't give me a wife, well, either he doesn't exist or he's sitting down on the job. Uh, so the, 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 the force of all of this, this theoria, is that once you have been saved and sanctified, now what? Now what? Yes, Michael. Yeah, well, for me, this experience was basically, okay, now that I am saved, I need, I look at everyone else is still on their way to hell. Yes. So I need to go and tell everyone to get saved yes. and get them saved somehow with, you know, I, I did say, well, God was helping me, so it wasn't totally a me thing, but if I didn't, then the guilt and despair would come upon me. They're going to go to hell because I didn't okay. tell them. Tell yes. them to get saved, and they didn't listen, or that I didn't do it right, or something like that. And then I, then I'd be, then I'd be scared, and I wouldn't tell anybody because I was afraid I'd do it wrong. But then when I did do it, then I'd have pride, saying, "Oh, I'm doing okay. pretty good now." And then I, then of course, you know, it comes after pride. So it's like just okay. like a cycle, continuing cycle, which drove me nuts. All right. Yes, exactly. The will of God now is for you to go out and save others. Yeah. There's nothing more for you to do, for yourself. God has saved you. And anything else you do is now works righteousness, which is now a sin to, you know, to, to, to trust in your own works for salvation. It also makes suffering meaningless. Explain, Travis. Well, when I was a Protestant, you know, suffering was just something that happened along the road. Since okay. Christ had already done everything there was to do, okay. it wasn't as though my suffering was cleansing me in any way. Okay. So I have no reason to willingly take on suffering. It was just some accidental thing that was happening to me. Okay, let's, let's make sure we don't drop this as we continue. That's an important point. So that is the theory of salvation. And so how would it affect your praxis? You know, how would it affect the, your walk in life? Um, you know, I don't... I, you know... I think, for one thing, it, has, it does a number on your inner soul. I think it turns you into a, into a Pharisee. I think it's a culture of self-righteousness. It produces self-righteousness. Um, it's a culture of entitlement. Uh, I'm entitled uh, to whatever I want. You know, God's job is to make me happy. Um, it's it's me-centered, um, and, it, and it determines how I live. I'm not really living anymore daily in the presence of God, if, but unless for whatever reason I want to, but there's no motivation, it seems to me. But there's no, I don't know. Well, it's basically the, the Americans, you can sum up the American version of the gospel as Jesus died, so we don't have to. Okay, that's it? Is that? Basically, yeah. Okay, I think that's, honestly, I think that's fair. It, it jives with my experience. Jesus died, so we don't have to. Yeah, I mean, it's, Boil down to that. I mean, obviously, yes, nobody would say that. They'd say, "No, well, that's not what I believe." But if you boil it down, that was the that that's was basically the, uh, what pe people believe. All right. A lot. So, as I say, I don't want to take too much time on this. <clears throat> I'm sure that we could share stories and uh, we could take up the whole time that is given to this section. But I don't particularly. I want to move on if we can. We may not be able to, but I want to move on if we can. So now let's let's set forth the the um, the theory of salvation as it is given to us in the Orthodox Church, um, the Church of the Apostles, <laughs> the Church of the Prophets, the Church of Moses. Here is the theoria of the vision of salvation. We traced it last period, the last catechism session, when we traced the exodus of Israel, basically from Eden to Eden. Salvation is returning to Eden. That turns this life into an exodus. We're on a journey daily. 
It makes us exiles. This is what this was an insight that Father Stefan shared with me that uh, to be to be an exodus and to be an exile in this world that's the he- that's heads and tails uh, the head and tails of the same coin. Uh, we are on a journey. Uh, this is not our country. This is not our. This is not where we are citizens. Our citizenship is up, is in heaven above. It's 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 in Eden. So then, um, to become a partaker of the divine nature means to participate in the mystery of this exodus. Um, it turns my whole life into an exodus. Um, so that, um, you know, we, look, we read the Bible now in the, in the eyes of the church, with the mind of the church, and we see, first of all, that there is a, an exodus of the Lord. There's the Lord's exodus. He comes out of himself. He leaves his home in heaven in order to come down to where we are. And then he takes our nature on his shoulders when he becomes incarnate, and he takes our nature all the way into hell, where we are rooted now, where we were rooted in our sins. He takes it into hell, and there he destroys hell, and he destroys death by his death. And then taking our nature upon his shoulders, he raises it from the dead, and then he ascends with it into heaven. So that his ascension is the completion of his exodus. Um, and then um, the Holy Spirit is given to us on Pentecost. <laughs> I mean, and, and honestly, in the, in the church of Nazareth, I, I, as I think back, I, I can't believe the, um, the irrationality that, that pervaded our theology. Um, what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? You know, what's the purpose of Pentecost? <laughs> Uh, it's to save you. That's what it is. It's to save you, to cleanse you from your sins. But in the Orthodox Church, it's whole lot, there's a whole lot more. The Holy Spirit is given to us on Pentecost so that now we can join the Christ. We can unite ourselves to Christ and go on this exodus with him. Now, when the Lord becomes incarnate, is conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the earthly exodus, you might say, begin. The inner exodus Begins, You could say, in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. It begins. So when we are united to Christ in our baptism, that is when we are conceived as, chi- as children of God in the womb of the church. You could also say that's when we become theotokos. We become mothers of God. Because the Christ is conceived in us in the flesh. So now that we have united ourselves to Christ, what does it say in St. Paul? You know, when we, the, 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 the uh, epistle for the baptism. Um, having been baptized into Christ, you have been united to him in the likeness of his death, he says. In the likeness of his death. And then a verse later or so he says, you have been united to him in his death. But we mustn't, and if you've been united to him in his death, then you are united to him in his resurrection. But you understand, the movement from death the resurrection is an, it, that's where the inner exodus begins. It's inner because it can't be seen. It's taking place within us. Yes, Michael. This is, this is, is a true meaning of what it means to be born again, right? To be a, come a child of God through the yeah. Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yes. Not like to what you we were talking about earlier, just believing you're born again. When yes. You this is the real, so we can say, yes, we are born again when we're baptized. And right, we, right, right. Yeah. Yes. Um, we are, we, are, we are born from above. Again, the, another translation for again is from above. It's yes. anothen, which can also mean again, but it also can mean from above, and it also can mean from the depths. It has those three meanings. So we are, we are born in the, from the depths, in the depths. Um, now, a critical piece here is our own will. Because salvation is understood, it's conceived in the Orthodox Church, as us loving the God who first loved us. And um, love means to deny yourself. It means to come out of yourself for the sake of the other. In this case, for the sake of Christ. It means to 
follow Christ. It means to take up your cross because I have united myself to Christ. If I'm uniting myself to Christ, that means I'm uniting myself to his humanity also. It means that I'm uniting myself to his suffering. I'm uniting myself to his exodus, which is taking him into the tomb and into hell and then into the resurrection. So I cannot unite myself to Christ if I too am not going into hell with Christ. Um, because, and, and I have to do, and I do this because I want to. If I don't want to, the Lord's not going to, he's not going to, he's going to honor my choice, not because that I don't want to. And he's not going to bother me. But if, but, so I have to want to because I, I, because I must, I must love the Lord God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. And to love him means to become one with him. But if I'm going to become one with him, it means that I'm going to become one with him in his death and in his resurrection. It's not enough just to believe that he died for my sins. I must unite myself to him in his death. Okay, this changes. This changes the way that I live now. Completely. Because my theory is now completely different. I now understand that when I was quote-unquote saved, when I received the Lord, and of course for us, we received the Lord not in an emotional experience, it might be emotional, but more deeply than that, we receive the Lord Jesus Christ in the font of our baptism. And if that isn't justification by grace through faith, then tell me what is. It's the Lord who's saving me in the baptismal waters. But how did I get to the baptismal waters in the first place? Because I wanted to. I wanted to. And if I was an infant, then it was my parents or, you know, my sponsor by proxy who wanted me to come and to be united to Christ. In other words, there was a will. There was a human will that was involved here. And that was a critical piece. So now, having been united, having united myself to Christ in the likeness of his death, and you know, to, to be in, in biblical terms, likeness equals participation. So I unite myself to Christ, and the likeness of his death means I unite myself to Christ by participating in his death. So that already, even in the, at the very beginning of my salvation, I'm already becoming a partaker of the divine nature. Specifically, I'm becoming a partaker of the human nature of Christ. But his human nature is united to his divine nature in Christ himself. So if I'm united to the human nature of Christ, I'm also united to the divine nature in Christ, in whom the two natures are one. So um, now my, so my, my the, the journey of myself, of my, uh, of my, so now my life becomes a journey, because my life has been united to the exodus of Christ. As he's coming down, becomes flesh and dwells among us, and continues his descent now clothed in our nature, all the way into, into death, and all the way down to hell, where we before were rooted. Um, so I'm uniting myself to Christ in his exodus. So that means a number of things. It means, for one thing, that um, if you, in order for, that we each one have a spiritual biography, a spiritual biography. And if you want to know what your spiritual biography is, just read the Bible. But read the Bible in the church, not outside the church where all these crazy notions are circulating. Read the Bible in the church. Because the inner journey or the inner essence of your life is the exodus of Israel. It is the exodus of the Lord as he descends from heaven and takes on our humanity all the way to death and to hell and then in his resurrection and to his ascension. Your spiritual biography will be differentiated from everyone else because it's your own. I mean, it will have its own peculiar details that pertain to your particular personality, your particular life, your life situation. But beneath that, in its inner essence, your spiritual biography is the same. It's not parallel to, it's not co a copy of, it is the inner exodus of the gospel that we read from page one of the Bible to the last page of the Bible. That is your spiritual biography. 
which means then that we need to be reading the Bible if we want to understand what we're, what we're all about. You know, where we've been, where we're going, where we are. We need to understand, we need to be reading the Bible. We need to be reading it, you know, reflectively. We need to be reading it um, in the church, in the prayers of the church, so that our eyes are open to understand what we're reading. So in this theory of salvation, in which my salvation begins, not just when I believe that Jesus died for my sins, but when I actually unite myself in a concrete way to his death and resurrection in the waters of the font, and I'm raised and I'm robed and I'm clothed with his garment of glory. I'm, re I'm, I'm sealed by the gift of the Holy Spirit. All of these concrete things that are happening in the church. Remember from the Liber Gradium, the visible is the face of the invisible. So when these visible things are being done to us, we're also touching the invisible. The invisible is touching us. And finally, we are brought to the Amvon, to the foot of the Amvon, and where Christ meets us from the altar... In the, per, in the image of the priest, who is the image of Christ, and in the image, in the icon of the priest, the bishop, or, but whatever, um, Christ gives himself to us as our food and drink. You see how the movement from the font, where you are united to Christ in his death, to the foot of the envoy, that is the template, if you will. That is marking out the exodus, the inner exodus of your life, where you're moving from your death in Christ to becoming a participant, to becoming a partaker of Christ, where he is your food and drink. Uh, you're receiving the Holy Spirit in the chrism, and you're also receiving the Holy Spirit in the Holy Eucharist, so that you are, you know, you're breathing the Holy Spirit. He's the air now that you breathe. So that my salvation began in my baptism. It wasn't one and done. And it's not like now the baptism is, out, is way back in the past and it's done. No. The baptism was actually the image of your whole life. And now your whole life is a walking, you know, day by day, a walking from the baptismal font where you were united to Christ in the likeness of his death to the foot of the envelope, which now becomes an image of the top of the mountain of his ascension. That's your whole life. So all of our life we should be living in our baptism. We are walking in the mystery of our baptism from death to life. So this changes my proxis, the way that I live my life. Now that I have been saved, now I have work to do. I have work to do. <laughs> what does St. Paul say? In fear and trembling, work out your salvation. And when he says fear and trembling, those are the same words for the myrrh bearers when they come to the tomb and they flee the tomb in fear and trembling but also in ecstasis. They're somehow taken out of themselves into this place where they meet Christ, where they become one with Christ. Um, and what is this work now that has begun? It is, <laughs> St. Paul says it. Now, begin to put to death what's earthly in you. Another place, we die daily for Christ. We live in the death of Christ. How do you live in the death of Christ? By working daily to put to death what's earthly in you. And what's earthly in you? The passions. Gluttony, lust, envy, greed, all those things, vainglory, all of those things that I mentioned. This is what we're called to put to death in us now. But the Lord isn't going to come down and zap you and make it suddenly so that you're, clear, you're cleared of all of these things, because again, your will is a central, piece, a central piece of this. Why is your will a central piece of this? Because it's the mystery of love. Love cannot be forced. Love must be freely received and freely given. And so if you want to unite yourself to Christ in the love of Christ who first loved us, we express our love, or at least we express our desire to love Christ by doing what he tells us to do, and that is daily to be putting to death what's earthly in us. That means that um, I have to be daily, I have to be, I have to, I mean, and it is work. It is work, and, and it can be, uh, <laughs> it can be, a, it can be, it is a suffering. It is a suffering, because, you know, if I'm, if I'm putting to death what's earthly in me, what am I putting to death? I'm putting to death my love for gluttony, my love for lust, 
my love for greed. That's what I'm putting to death. So what I'm fighting in this, in this battle of salvation now, see, this is, this is me going through the wilderness now. They're like the Israelites going through the wilderness. Jesus coming up from the, from the Jordan and going through the wilderness and to, all the way to his tomb. This is the wilderness now that I'm going through. My, the, the, my whole life now is the wilderness. My soul is the wilderness. This is the wilderness I'm going into to put to death what's earthly in me. And what I discover is that what I'm trying to put to death is my own self-love, my own self-will, my love for the passions. And if the passions are the fruit of death, then what I'm trying to put to death in me is my love of death. Now that was kind of a revelation to me when it hit me, that actually what we love in this life is we love death. We love death because we love all the things that, that bring about death. Um, so I have to put to death, to put to death my love of death, which means that I have to put to death my own, it means that I'm fighting really against myself. I'm not fighting the devil. I mean, the devil was chased away in the font. I'm fighting myself. I'm fighting my inclination towards all of these things. Um, why, why do I continue, have to continue fighting them? Because, like I said, I have to choose daily to love Christ and not myself. It's an act of the will. So that every day now becomes for me, it becomes another day of repentance. There isn't nothing to do. There's everything to do. It is the act, it is the work of repentance. And that means not only that the battle against these passions can become fierce because you're fighting yourself. You're fighting your own inner root. It can, I'm There's nothing more fierce, I would say, than this battle. And it's the suffering that comes from this battle. This is the suffering that the Holy Fathers are talking about when they say you cannot be a Christian without suffering. They're not talking about physical suffering that comes to us from outside. Yes, that might also be involved. But we, you, 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 they're talking about the inner suffering, the agony, the inner agony of the soul when she will not give in to what she dearly wants to give in to. As I like to say it, um, all of your life, the passions have been coming at you, they have been enticing you, and all this while you have been saying yes to them. Now you have to start saying no. So imagine, if my theory is that I am saved because I believe that Jesus is the Christ and he died on the cross for me, what would be the purpose, what would be the motivation of me taking up this inner battle? And all of these passions, I, if I even saw them, I don't know that I would even see them. There'd be no incentive, there'd be no vision that would direct me to fight them. So um, I said that, it, that this battle can be exceedingly fierce. It can also be terribly exhausting, to be quite honest. Why? Because you have to become attentive to what's going on inside of you. You have to become attentive to your thoughts. You have to become attentive to the movements that are taking place in you. They're trying to, they're rumbling around in you. You have to become increased, you have to be vigilant, not to allow your thoughts to go off. In other words, not to allow your thoughts to go away to the west. Your thoughts must go constantly to the east, and you will discover that almost every hour, every day, every hour, every minute, to quote St. Herman of Alaska, this work that you have to be doing is constantly reigning in your erotic desire and directing it away from the west and towards the east almost every minute. This explains Pentecost, as we'll explain in the sermon tomorrow. The, Holy, the, the Lord gives us his Holy Spirit because without the Holy Spirit we would not have the strength to do this. Our soul would still be filthy, it would still be sinful. We would still be weighed down by our love for sin, our love for death. And so he gives his Holy Spirit to us on Pentecost so that now in the power of the Holy Spirit, we find in ourselves the strength to take up our cross and to begin this fight of denying ourselves daily and putting to death what's earthly in us. So, you see, what I'm trying to say then is that if you're being received into the Orthodox, if you want to be received into the Orthodox Church, it's not like you have to learn um, so much information and then take a test and pass it with a certain percentage 
and now you're ready to become orthodox. It's very simple. If you want to be received into the church, the question is very simple. Are you ready to take up this fight in the power of Christ and to begin the fight, the battle of taking hold of your will, taking hold of your erotic yearning, and turning it away from the West and turning it to the East. If you are ready to do that, and you want to do that, you're ready to be received into the church. Nonetheless, we put you under a period of catechesis because we want to make sure you know what you're getting into. It's much more than just believing that Jesus died for your sins. It is the work of uniting yourselves to Christ in the likeness of his death, by participating in his death, by participating in the suffering of the cross. So what Travis was talking about with suffering, this is what transfigures suffering into the, into the death of Christ. Remember, it was by the death of Christ that he destroyed death. So by our sufferings, this inner suffering of the soul as we're trying to fight ourselves and, and turn ourselves towards the love of God, it's the suffering by which we unite ourselves to Christ that transfigures our suffering into the power of the resurrection. And as we fight in the power of the Holy Spirit, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, with His help, we choose to say no to all of these things. That's how we are slowly cleansed. And that's how our soul is slowly straightened out and turned in the direction of these. It doesn't happen like this. It doesn't happen like that. With nobody does it happen like that. So what I like to say to, um, you know, so I find that, that, that people who are received into the church from these Protestant backgrounds, they're kind of surprised sometimes. After they're received into the church to discover that the, that the battle becomes even more fierce. In fact, they didn't even know there was a battle before. They didn't realize to what degree they were just flow, following the flow of their passions. Because they had no reason to be aware of that. They just, you know, this is what I want to do, so this is what I'm, what I'm going to do. So when they come into the church, they are surprised to discover that these, past, that these desires don't end. While you are in the initial glow of your baptism and your chrismation, yeah, they may end. They may end for a time. That's the grace of the Holy Spirit visiting you and showing you what you've come into. You've come into the grace of the Holy Spirit who is the one who cleanses you and heals you and restores you to your original beauty. But you remember at the end of, well, those of you who have been to the service, you remember that at the end of the, of the, of the service, we take the chrism off. We wipe it off. Because at some point, in your life as you leave the church, when you leave the church, you're leaving heaven where the Holy Spirit dwells and is active. You want him now to become active in your life, in your body, because now your body has become a little church. But when you leave the, world, the church, you're going out into the world where you're going to be attacked viciously from outside and from inside. And now the and so, in other words, you're going to be tested because now you're on the exodus. You're going through the wilderness. Like Israel was tested, you're going to be tested. What are you being tested for? To see if you will say no to the passions and yes to God. Whereas before you were saying yes to the passions and no to God. And so it can be fierce. So what I tell, the, what I tell these newly uh, chrismated, baptized Orthodox, when they come to a confession, they're all... They're all in despair because they have fallen into sin again. And I thought I was safe from that. Well, of course, you were, that's what you were taught in the Protestant Theoria. And so, and, under, and, and still living in that Theoria, they come to the confession thinking that somehow they have fallen away. God has, le has left them. They have, they, you know, uh, God has abandoned them because they have sinned and they have backslidden. What I like to tell them is no. You're right where you're supposed to be. When you are received into the Orthodox Church, your journey through the wilderness begins. And as you go through the wilderness, all of these forces are going to come at you. 
All those forces that were coming at you before, you just gave in to them. Now they're going to keep coming at you so that you now can say no. And the, and, and the love of your heart, you can now set up. This is what you have to choose to do this. The Lord is the king. He cannot choose to do this for you. Because if, if he did it for you, you would cease to be human. To be human is to be in the image of God. To be in the image of God is to be a, a self-determining creature. Is to be a loving creature. And if the Lord just did it all for us, where would be our, where, where would be our love? You know, we, we, there would be no exercise of love. So we have to choose to do this. We have to choose to say no to these passions. And so we're going to be tested when we go out there. And so when you find yourself falling into the same old patterns of behavior, the same old habits, the same old sins, it doesn't mean that all is lost. It means that you're right where you should be. It's like, okay, now's the time for battle. Now's the time for battle. Now you're being tested. The Lord is wanting to test your heart. In which direction are you going to go now? Are you going to go back in the direction of your old loves? Or are you going to go in the direction of Christ? The new love of your heart. And if you choose to go in the direction of Christ, yes, you will find that's when the battle becomes fierce. Exceedingly fierce. And you might even think you're going to fall, uh, give in to it because it's so strong. But here's where the Holy Spirit is helping you. The Holy Spirit will withdraw his grace from us. He will withdraw his grace because he wants us to exercise our own spiritual muscles. And if we keep calling on him, if we really work hard, not to let our mind go towards the west, but towards the east, the Holy Spirit, when he feels that it's time and you've been tested long enough, then he will come in. And he will, he, will, he will overshadow you. He will fill you with his joy, his grace, his peace. And the experience that you had in the glow of your holy baptism, the holy chrismation, will be revisited, only it will be even greater now. Because you have descended a little bit lower, a little bit lower in your heart. You've gone to this a little bit deeper depths, and now you're able to love the Lord from deeper in your heart. So then after you have experienced and tasted again the joy of the Holy Spirit, well, okay, you, go and you, 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 pick up, you, you pick up camp and you continue through the wilderness to the next battle. So brothers and sisters, this is why we need to be in the church. The church is not a body of ideas. It's not, you know, it's not an institution, a social institution. It is the very body and blood of Christ who has conquered death by his death, who has given to us his Holy Spirit, so when you come into the church, you are coming into Christ. Whether you're, whether you're still an inquirer, a catechumen, or a faithful, you are coming into Christ. Every word, every prayer, every sound, every gesture carries Christ. So even if you're not at the point yet where you have become a partaker of Christ's uh, body and blood, nonetheless you can be partaking of Christ just in the, in the worship of the church, just by feeding on Christ with your ears, feeding on Christ with your eyes, feeding on Christ with your body, making the sign of the cross, standing instead of sitting, unless you have to sit, um, being reverent, you know, uh, and, and being attentive to all that's going on. You are feeding Christ. And when you come to the church, when you come to the worship of the church, you will be, and you're coming into Christ, that is like your oasis. So like a weekly oasis where you're coming into Christ, you're fed, you're nurtured, you're nourished, um, you're strengthened, you taste again the, the you know, the, um, <clears throat> you taste again, again the goodness of Christ, and you are strengthened to go out again and continue the battle. So that, you know, so you're not coming to the church to listen, you know, to, you know, to listen to a bunch of, to listen to a sermon. Even the sermon has as its goal to set before you this theoria and to get you ready to come and partake of Christ's body and blood so that you can go out into the field, out into the wilderness, and do the battle. So, all right. I've taken up too much time of mine, but that's okay, because what I want to do with the uh, saint is uh, relatively short. Um, but before, so we have time, even though uh, we only have about five minutes, eight minutes to do the saint. I'd like to uh, field any observations or comments or questions if you have any.
Mitch. Yeah. Um, maybe I just would like to hear what you think about this as you were talking about um, kind of the inner exodus. And one of the things that I was taught growing up was that the way that especially St. Paul talks about sanctification and salvation in certain places as being sort of a past tense, where he says, like in 1 Corinthians 1, that you're sanctified, you're saved, all of those things, but then there's also a future tense that he uses and like work out your salvation, those sort of things. And one of the ways that we talked about that or explained it was that there is this heavenly reality about yourself that when you're saved, um, that there's sort of a, I don't know exactly how we would, <laughs> uh, what would you say, like explain it philosophically or something, but, um, but there's this like disconnected sense where there's part of you that's sort of like the Roman seven, like you're, you're right. still um, <clears throat> in your sinful state, but you're sort of, your journey as a Christian is to sort of realize like what Christ has done in a declarative. Uh, in and you a see how that is governed by the theoria? You see how that theology is governed by a certain theoria? So it's reading the scriptures in the light of that theoria. So it's trying to make this, the verses, the scriptures, fit the preconceived theoria, which did not come from the church. Where did it come from? I don't know, Calvin, Luther, Menno Simons, I don't know. But they were not in the church. Um, so salvation, sanctification. See, what's, what's governing that is the understanding of salvation and sanctification as simply believing that Jesus died for my sins, which was in the past tense. But in this theory of the church, to believe, it, to believe in Jesus means that I united myself to Christ, which was in the past. It's not like I have to keep uniting myself to Christ. I did unite myself to Christ. We even say that in the baptismal service. At the very, we have three sets of, of petitions. Do you, uh, um, do you unite yourself to Christ? We ask that three times. And at the end we say, have you united yourself to Christ? So having united yourself to Christ at your baptism... Now the exodus begins. You see, with the theory that's governing our reading of the scriptures is the vision of reality as an exodus. And as I want to show further on, is that this exodus, which is a movement, is the movement of erotic love. It is the Lord coming on an exodus, which is the expression of his erotic yearning for us, being met by our going on joining him on this exodus, which is the expression of our erotic yearning for him. So in this exodus, we are unite, in this, in this exodus, we are uniting ourselves to Christ, in the love of Christ, having, having, having been cleansed of our sins, back, so that the root of our life now is no longer death. It is Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's the holiness of Christ. That's now the root of my life. And on that root, I now walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, and do this work that I'm supposed to do. Walk in the light as he is in the light. I don't stop walking in the light. I continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. But that means that if I'm walking in the light, that means that I'm putting to death all that's earthly in me. So, I, I mean, it's like, it's like the, the vision you're describing, it's, it's kind of right, but it's a bit distorted. And... Your question also reveals to what extent we can be unconsciously still influenced by the old theoria, the old vision. So my use of the tomb is to say that in order to open, for your eyes to be opened and to see the reality, the mystery of Christ, you must die absolutely to everything. You can't hold on to that theoria anymore. Even if it makes sense to you. You cannot hold on to it. Because if you so as long as you're holding on to it, well, listen to your question. Were you not judging in some way the theoria of the church against this theoria? That has to be put to death. And yet you just you know <laughs> It's not, a, it's not a theory of salvation that we're talking about. It is the theory of the vision of Christ. And in the vision of Christ, everything is put to death. 
everything. <laughs> and that's the work, to put to death everything in me, both my thoughts, you know, my understandings, so that I can see Christ. And when I see Christ, it's like, truly, you see something completely different, because now you're seeing onto the other side. Even on, on this, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're sensing it, maybe. I can hear in that what you're describing. There's a certain sense. They're trying to make sense of it. And they're also trying to account for the experience that they, all, that they seem to have. But they're, it's like they're trying, trying to do it with one leg, with a high, one hand tied behind their back. And so they, they're not, they're, they don't understand what the scripture is really saying, so they try to fill in the gaps of their ignorance with their own speculative solutions, which just leads them further astray. Any other comments, observations, questions? Why are you looking perplexed? I, I was just trying to understand what Mitch's question actually was. No, it's, it's the, uh, the one-time salvation, that I was saved in the past and that's it. Right, Mitch? Yeah, I guess I think we probably would categorize, like, Protestant would categorize it more as, like, the process of saying Yeah, it's just the idea that, like, you would, yeah, I guess what you're, yeah, it's like what you're saying, it's that it's trying to reconcile. Yeah, it's a process of sanctification, but on what basis? Right, yeah. On the yeah, basis yeah. of believing that Jesus died for my sins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as we are saying, it's a process, but it's based mm -hmm. on uniting myself inside and outside, word, thought, and deed, with the death of Christ. So that I'm not just believing it as a, as a theory that governs my life. I'm believing it as the reality that is becoming incarnate in me. Mm -hmm. I'm becoming that theory. It's becoming incorporated in me. I'm being deified. <laughs> um, does that make sense? Other questions, comments, observations? Mm -hmm. Yes, Garrett? So <clears throat> basically to summarize, the difference between the Protestant view and the Orthodox view is the Protestant view is more intellectual yes. and internal. Yes. And you're, you're saying the Orthodox view is holistic. It's, it's well, like, I wouldn't say the, Orthodox, the Protestant view is internal. I would not. It's wholly intellectual. Mm -hmm. And whatever sentiments and or emotions produce or proceed from the intellectual understanding. So there's no spirituality. That I'm sounds harsh. I'm sorry? I've often heard it described as Gnostic. I don't know. I don't know about that. I'd have to think about that. But it was, there's no, well, my point is that there's no spirituality. It's emotionalism. So Sentimentality that is taken for spirituality. How would you define spirituality? Oh, how do you define it? It's becoming deified. It's becoming one with Christ. Um, it is, I think maybe St. Siloan would say, to become, to be, um, what, uh, true spirituality <coughs> is when you find it when you find yourself loving the Lord God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your enemy as yourself. For St. Silwan, that's the test. If you cannot love your enemy, then you're not, and it is not the Spirit of Christ. If it's not the Spirit of Christ, then what is it? Well, that's a good question. I think I would just soon leave it there. It is not of God. Let's say it's of the wisdom of human opinion, trying to make sense of things on its own, on its own conceit. That was the, the question I was going to ask. Is, it the, is there grace and salvation outside of the Orthodox Church? Or is it mainly, um, let's say you're listening to a Christian worship band and you're feeling a, a sense of connection, is that... Well, now, Michael, what again? What is the church? It's the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. It's not an enclosed doctrine. It's the body of Christ. Psalm 18, Psalm 19. Um, he has placed the tabernacle of his body in the sun. Beautiful, beautiful psalm. Um, and he, he goes forth from his, and he goes, and he, and he comes, as he, so he, in, in the sun, he has placed his, the tabernacle of his body. And he comes forth as a bridegroom from his bridal chamber. As a giant, he exults like a giant running his course. Um, the, the, the imagery is passing over to the, the imagery of the sun. Um, from one corner of the heavens is his exodus. That's the word, is his exodus. 
and his, the, the, the conclusion of his circuit, the going down of his exodus, is to the other corner of the universe. And then it says, so in other words, you see how it embraces the whole cosmos. This is the Lord's body, like the sun, embracing the whole of creation. And then it says, and there is no one who is hidden from his warmth. No one who is hidden from his warmth. And as he says in another place, the, 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 the love of God reigns on the righteous. The sun rays, shines on the just and the unjust. It rains on the just and the unjust. It rains. Well, that takes us back to the prophets. Could be a, sim, uh, a reference to the prophetic image of the snowmelt river or in Isaiah. It is rain that comes down from heaven. But what, you know, that, that would, those are all metaphors. The warmth of the, of the sun, of the Lord who has, has the sun. Uh, the, the nurturing, the, the, the life-giving uh, effect of the rain coming down from heaven. These are all also images of God's love. And no one is, no one is hidden from his love. That it, what determines us, what determines whether or not, what, what, the, the determining factor is whether or not we turn our face to that love and then receive the warmth into our so that instead of just, just shining outside of us, it now begins to shine in us. The Orthodox Church is not defined by doctrine. I mean, we do have doctrine. Do not, let's not downplay the importance of the doctrine. We do. But the doctrine itself is pointing beyond itself to the mystical reality of Christ that is carried in those doctrines. And Christ, the Church, is the body of Christ. So wherever the body of Christ is to be found, there is the church in some form or another. So, yes, Michael. Yeah, back to uh, St. Siloan. Uh, he says, love your enemy as yourself. Uh, Two-part question. How do I know who my enemy is? And two, what would love for my enemy look like? Because <laughs> I don't you know, I totally don't know if I even have any enemies in flesh and blood. I know you have to... The, Spiritual powers that are, that are well. If you don't enemies, think you have enemies, love those. if you think you don't have enemies in flesh and blood, let's not go about making some enemies. <laughs> let's just leave it at that. <laughs> right. I, I I don't know. That's what I'm saying. What is it? How do I know if I have any? I wouldn't even worry about it. Oh, I'm mm -hmm. not worried about it. I'm yeah. just curious. So I can practice. If I want to practice what Saint Silwan is teaching. So it's like I gotta have an enemy to love. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm not loving my enemies, and I'm not. Yeah. Don't. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I, I have enemies. I have enemies. So what do I do? I don't know what love for enemies looks like. I have an idea. It means that I love them as myself. Well, I don't want to love them as myself. Well, how do you practice loving them as yourself? I, I pray for them. Okay. That, to me, is the first step. You don't just suddenly love your enemies. Like everything else, this is a journey. Yeah, so You're going say, up the ladder. Say somebody does something wrong to me or something like that, and I pray for them, and God forgives them, that's... Yes, there, sometimes there are some people that I can't even say their name, but I force myself to say their name in my prayer for them. Okay. To me, that's the first step. I cannot make myself love my enemy. That's St. Silouan's point. It's the Holy Spirit that enables yeah. me to love yeah. my enemy. Yeah. So what I need to do simply is just be faithful and be obedient to Christ to the degree that I can yeah. and follow and do what's right in front of me. If we try to do it ourselves, if we have some success, then that's when the pride comes in. Exactly. And if we yeah. don't, then that's when the despair comes in. That's yes, why. and that's when the fall begins. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I want to hand this over to the highlight of our class, to my wife. But let me quote something from St. John of Kronstadt. He was a Russian, a priest in the Russian Orthodox Church. What was it, the early, in the 19th century or 20th century? I don't remember where he was relative to the revolution. But he's a very, he, was a, he was a saint, and uh, he, um, he, has a, uh, he is very high in the, uh, in the standing of the Orthodox Church. Um, but this is from St. Nikolai Velimirovich. It's from uh, the Prologue of Ochred, Volume 2, Volume 1. It's from May 31st, which was Wednesday. This is what, was re was what we read from St. Nikolai Velimirovich. He says, St. Saint Saint Nikolai says, this life is a spiritual struggle, to conquer or to be conquered. If we conquer, we will enjoy the fruits of victory through all eternity. If we are defeated, we will endure the horrors of destruction through all eternity. Again, you, can you hear? Life is a spiritual struggle. I did not get that in orth, in, in outside of the Orthodox Church. Did not hear that. 
because there's no vision of me having to uh, go into my soul and work to put to death what's earthly in me. There was no vision. And as I say, we like to talk about taking up our cross, but practically we were taught to lay down the cross, as is exhibited abundantly in the fact that in no church outside the Orthodox Church is there a cross. Well, there will be a cross up there, but you do not have a corpus on it. And you, do you wear a cross around your neck? When I was growing up, no. Uh, if we, um, this life is a duel between man and all that opposes God. God is an almighty ally to all who sincerely call upon him for help. This life is not a joke or a plaything, says Father John of Kronstadt. But men turn it into a joke or a, and plaything. He's talking about Russian Orthodox Christians, Dan. <laughs> because that's where he was. He was in the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, the capricious play around with the time given to us for preparing for eternity. They play around with empty words. They gather together as guests. They sit and chatter. And after that, they sit and play this or that game. Or they watch this or that video, or this or that TV show, or this or that movie. They gather in theaters, and there they entertain themselves. All of life is an amusement for them. But woe to them who do nothing but entertain themselves. I feel that that summarizes what we're trying to say, that what we're trying to emphasize, that to become orthodox is to take up your cross, to take up your cross, and to deny yourself and begin the fight with the help of the Holy Spirit, basically against yourself. You're trying to restore yourself. You're trying to restore the image of God that you are. You're trying to tear it away from the devil who has taken you, us hostage. Um, and now, of course, he has been cleansed. We have been cleansed of the devil in our holy baptism. But now our will, so now our will needs to be trained, needs to be retrained, uh, so that we don't want, so that even when we want to go back to Egypt, like the Israelites did in the wilderness, we don't. We don't. When we want to build a golden calf, we don't. We stay faithful to the Lord. That's the fight. All right, I've taken enough of my wife's time, so...